Thank you, guys. Um, this is joint work with Ram Sriharsha of Hortonworks. Um, I am the SVP of Data Science at uh, Media Math. I joined there recently after uh, a, f a few years at uh, Yahoo running Data Science. Um, and today, I will be talking about a problem that we've been working on at Media Math. And that is the problem of estimating the impact of ads on users. Okay? So now this problem is important not just at Media Math, but across the entire digital marketing world, or in fact, the, across the entire marketing world, right? And so to set the stage, um, I want to give a very brief introduction to Media Math. So Media Math is what's called an ad tech company. What that means is we provide a software platform for advertisers to set up, manage, maintain, execute, and optimize their ad campaigns across all channels, like, digital, uh, like um, video, mobile, and desktop. Right? So what that entails is we listen to 100 billion ad opportunities every day coming in from the exchanges. So these are opportunities to serve ads. And in response to each incoming ad opportunity, we have to make extremely fast decisions. Within milliseconds, we have to decide whether to bid, which opportunities to bid on, and if we do decide to bid on them, how much to bid on them optimally. So in order to make optimal bidding decisions, as you can imagine, we have to process petabytes of data across the entire spectrum of user activity, including page visits, clicks, conversions, and ad impressions. Right? So um, anyone excited yet? OK. So we are hiring. We're looking for really good data scientists and data engineers um, who, are, who are great with uh, Spark, Scala, Python, machine learning, data science, or any combination of these things. So we have a booth in the expo area. So please come and say hi to our uh, friends over there. And also, we're sponsoring um, happy hour drinks today at uh, 6 o'clock. OK. So, so in, in this industry, um, well, obviously in the ad industry, one of the biggest problems, one of the most important problems is predicting how users will respond to ads. Right? And that is a machine learning problem. Right? But that's not what I'm talking about today. It's a very important problem, and we use Spark heavily for this at our company. But, but the subject of my talk today is a different one, which is how do you quantify the impact of ad exposure on a user's behavior? Okay? So that, this is not a prediction problem. It's a measurement problem. right? So, and that's the subject of this talk. And this leads me to another distinction I want to make, which is among the whole universe of Spark applications, there are two different broad kinds of applications. So most of the applications that people hear about are applications where there's already a huge data set, and we want to process that. So for example, machine learning is one such application. right? But that's not what I'm talking about today. Today, we're going to talk about analyzing simulated or sampled big data. Okay? in the context of measuring the ad impact on users. All right. So in the rest of the talk, these will be some of the key um, conceptual takeaways. Right? So we'll understand various issues in ad lift measurement or ad impact measurement, such as how do you properly define ad impact? Okay? And how do you get confidence bounds on, um, on the impact of your ads? And how do you get this con uh, defined confident bounds, and how do you actually compute them? And we in, in particular, we look at uh, Bayesian techniques for computing confidence bounds. And um, a specific kind of Bayesian technique called Gibbs sampling, which is a Markov chain Monte Carlo method. Uh, so we'll dive a, a bit deeper into the, those kind of techniques. And finally, we'll also talk about how we use Spark to help with all of these, uh, these procedures. So there's two, two kinds of uses. One is for sampling to get confidence bounds, like I just said. And also, the other is um, what I call simulations. So when there are complex phenomena that you cannot analyze 
or that are very difficult to uh, write formulas for, the best way to un understand the impact of those phenomena on, on ad impact is to simulate them. All right, so, so in the ad advertising or marketing world, there is this famous, famous line by John Wanamaker where he says, um, he says, I know that half the money that I spend on ads is wasted. I just don't know which half, right? So a lot of advertisers, or every advertiser uh, ever, is really interested in finding out the impact of their ads on users. So they want to understand if the money they're spending on, on showing ads to users is leading to the desired behavior from users. So in particular, I want to say, so let's say uh, a population of users has seen some ads. What the advertiser would love to know is, if they did not see those ads, if that same population did not see those ads, would they have responded the same way as if they had seen the ads? So in other words, how much is the incremental benefit of seeing an ad, right? That's the important question. And this is what keeps most of them awake at night. Okay. So ad impact measurement, and let's just uh, let's dive in a bit deeper into this. There's, there's two classes of, two general classes of measuring ad impact, I mean methods for measuring the impact of ads. One is what we call observational studies, where, where um, you basically look at a population of users that happen to have been exposed to ads um, as part of your normal ad serving, and then you compare that population with, with a population that has not seen the ads. So as you might, might guess, there is a bias problem here, because the problem, uh, the population that has seen the ads is prob probably going to be very, very different, or statistically not at all the same as the population that has not seen the ads. So there is a bias issue here. There are various ways to compensate for this bias, and we are looking at some of these methods at Media Math, but that's not what I'm talking about today. There is another broad class of methods for measuring ad impact, which is to conduct randomized experiments. So we randomly select a population of users to show ads to, and then do not show ads to the others. And then we compare how they respond. So this is the topic of this talk, okay? All right, so let's look at a very simple setup of how one might want to measure the impact of advertising, right? This is the ideal randomized test that you would like to do. So let's say for a company like Medium Math, where we, we're getting billions of ad serving opportunities. So we get an ad serving opportunity. We do a matching and targeting, so to figure out which advertisers are eligible to, to bid for this opportunity. And once we figure out an advertiser, we, we calculate their optimal bid. We submit that bid to the exchange, and then we find out that we won or lost that bid. Okay? And then after we win the bid, we randomly assign that user to test or control. Maybe 10% of the time is assigned that to control. And then we can compare the performances of test and control. RT is the response rate of test, and RC is the response rate of control. And then we can define ad lift as just the ratio of uh, like the incremental um, improvement of RT compared to RC. Okay? This is the idealized randomized test. All right, so we just saw that estimating response rates is key to measuring ad impact. So let's dive deeper into how do we measure response rates. Here's a simple example. If we see K equals 200 conversions out of 10,000 users, what is a good estimate for the response rate? So obviously we will do our estimate like this, which is R hat equals K over N, which gives us about exactly 2%. But the more important question is, what is our confidence in this number? So in other words, we want to find the 90% confidence bounds on this estimate. There are many ways of doing this, but I'm going to talk about a particular way today, which will generalize to other more complicated situations. So we want to find uh, two numbers, Q5 and Q95, such that they have this property. So if Q5, for example, should have this property, which is if Q5 is the real response rate, then 
then we should observe the observed response rate with probability less than 5%. So that's the property that Q5 needs to satisfy, and, and a similar property for Q95. Okay? So the question is, how do we find these numbers? You might think that you have to try all possible true response rates and run simulations and, um, and find the numbers that have exactly the properties that you want. But there is actually, it's actually much simpler than that. So the idea is we'll take a Bayesian approach. Okay? We'll call them Bayesian confidence bounds. So we'll randomly generate response rates that are consistent with the data. So in the Bayesian world, what that means is we sample the response rates from the posterior of the uh, distribution given the data. And then from that sample, we will find the 5 and 95 percentiles, and those will be our confidence bounds. So this is how it works. This is the Bayesian setup. So we start with a, the usual, um, in the Bayesian setting, we, we start with the unknown. We assume that the rate is unknown with the, some prior distribution PR. Usually we'll take that to be the beta distribution with 1, 1 parameters, which is the same as a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. And then we sample from the posterior of that distribution of the rates. And the posterior is simply the uh, product of two things. One is the likelihood where of the data given the rate and then the prior of the, of the rate. So the, the data is simply represented by the number of conversions, k. So I'm abbreviating that to k. So p of r given k is proportional to these two things, the product of these, the likelihood and the prior. When we write it out, you'll see that the, um, the likelihood is just the binomial likelihood, right? So it's the rate to the power of k and 1 minus the rate to the power of n minus k times the beta. And the beta has exactly the right form that when you multiply these two together, you will actually get the, the beta parameters get added to the, to the exponents in the likelihood, right? And, and that is exactly, again, a beta distribution. So, so finally, your posterior is actually a beta distribution with these uh, additional, uh, where you've added 1 to the, to the k and n minus k, okay? So this is a nice property that the beta distribution gives us. It turns out it's called, um, conjug it's called a conjugate uh, distribution relative to the uh, binomial distribution. Because when you multiply the binomial likelihood with the beta prior, you're getting a beta posterior, which is a beautiful property. And that's, um, that gets very heavily used in, uh, in the Bayesian setting. Right? So, and then finally, we compute the 5 and 95 percentiles from the generated random rates. So that's how it works. So um, in summary, what we do is this. To, to get confidence bounds for your response rates, we, uh, we sample m different rates from the beta distribution with modified with this additional uh, exponent. And then we compute the quantiles. It's very simple, as simple as a couple of lines of Python. The first line gets your samples, the sam random rates. And the next line will get the quantiles. So this is how roughly it works. So you generate all these random rates. Remember, these are not just random rates generated with no constraint. These are rates that are consistent with your data. Okay? But that's because you're sampling it from the posterior. So you keep generating these random rates, and maybe the density looks like this. And then you chop off the extremes and get the fifth and 95th percentiles, and those are your confidence bounds. right? Okay, so going back to our example of where the estimate was 2%, it turns out the confidence region is 1.8 to 2.2%. So that's, no, so that's a pretty simple um, uh, calculation to keep in mind for the, for the, for the rest of the talk. Um, so we talked about response rates. Let's talk about how um, we compute ad lift now. Okay, so we'll, let's take this simple example. There's 10,000 control users and 200 conversions. And um, there are 100,000 te test users and 2,200 conversions. So we'll calculate these response rates of each of test and control as before. And um, turns out control has a 2% response rate, and test has a 2.2% response rate. Okay? And then the lift calculation is with that formula that we had is, is, is 10%. That's our estimate for lift. But of course, our bigger question is, 
Well, so this is a great lift, right? It looks great. 10% is very hard to get. Um, but of course, the uh, question is how reliable is it? Right? Maybe the lift is negative. What if the true lift could be negative or zero? And we are actually observing 10%. That's possible, right? So we need to quantify that. So the idea is to, we, we need, we need, Bayesian, uh, we need uh, confidence bounds. And we'll follow a Bayesian method again. So the idea is similar. We'll randomly generate test response rates and control response rates from the posterior distribution. And then for each pair of RC and RT, we will compute the lift. And then again take the fifth and 95th percentiles of the randomly generated lifts, and those are your confidence bounds. Right? So going back to this example, um, where we estimated 10%, the 90% confidence bound here is minus 2.7% to 23.6%. So we're not able to rule out the possibility that the true lift is actually negative. So which is interesting, right? So at this point, um, uh, so that's a fair question, right? Uh, fair question. There are two, uh, two answers to this. One is a relatively obvious answer, because we are not computing lift and confidence bounds for just one campaign. We're doing this across thousands of campaigns, across thousands of advertisers. So. We use Spark uh, very heavily to make this very scalable and efficient. But there's a more subtle answer to this question, which, uh, which I'll get to in the next few slides. So in order to get to that, I want to add a slight complication to this scenario. The complication is, has to do with bias. Okay? And let's see how that comes across. So let's revisit our, um, our um, simple idealized randomized test. Okay, so we have this ad opportunity, then we decide to bid, we submit to the auction, we win or lose, and then we assign to test or control. Now, if you observe carefully, there is a problem here. And the problem is, anyone guess what the problem here is? Okay. So the problem is from the advertiser's point of view. Okay, they've already paid for the bid. They won the bid, that means the advertiser already spent money on this. But 10% of the time, it's going to a control user, and the, they're not seeing the ad, right? So bids on control users are wasted. No one likes this, right? Advertisers are reluctant to pay for ads that are not being shown, most of them. OK. So what can we do, right? So it turns out if. Um, Let's design a somewhat less wasteful randomized test, okay, as follows. Instead of waiting for winning the auction and then assigning to test or control, we will assign to test or control before. So we'll, right after we do the matching and targeting, we'll assign to test and control. And if the user gets assigned to test, then we submit the bid, and then we find out if we win or lose, and the winners will see the ad, and the losers will not see the ad. OK? Right. There is a problem here, of course. Now, there's a new problem, which is there's a bias between test winners and the control population. It could be that we happen to win precisely those users who are highly responsive. It could happen in the auction, right? So that the test winner's population is statistically not equivalent to the control population. So we cannot meaningfully make a comparison to compute lift accurately. So how do we measure lift in this type of scenario? So to do this, we have to define lift much more carefully now. So let's look at this uh, setup again in our uh, favorite uh, Khan Academy style uh, drawings. Okay, so let's have, we, we divided the population into test and control, okay, and then we find out if we won or lost, and the winners see an ad and the losers do not. Let's define some observable response rates here, okay. RTW1 is, TW stands for test winner, so the 1 stands for the fact that they've seen the ad, so this is an ob observation that we can make after running this through thousands of, or you know, millions of uh, users we will have an observable test response rate, RTW1. 
And then RTL is test loser's response rate, and RC is controlled response rate. Now I'm going to add a little bit, um, a, a slightly different response rate here, which is the RTW0. What that is, is you look at the test winners who saw the ad, and you ask those same winners, if they did not see the ad, how much would their response rate have been? It's a hypothetical question that you're asking. So like I said, this is hypothetical. The others are observable. Okay. And then we can define lift in terms of these two different variations of the test winning response rates. So it's the ratio of the observed test winner's response rate and, and the hypothetical non-exposed response rate, you know, and, and minus one. So this turns out to be the right way to define ad lift in this framework. And it's very similar to how in the clinical trials literature, they define, um, statisticians define the effectiveness of a drug when in a randomized test where some, of, some people on the test side do not take the drug. They do not comply with, uh, with the, with the uh, experiment. Okay. So, so the main idea is again, so this is how we estimate ad lift in this framework. We start with various different observed response rates, including the test loser's response rates, right? And then we um, also look at the win rate. So in the auction, what fraction of the test users are winning the auction, okay? And then we show that we can compute the hypothetical unexposed test winner's response rate with a simple formula, and then compute lift. So this, like I said, this is similar to what they call treatment effect under non-compliance in clinical trials. So the question again is how do we get 90% confidence intervals in this more complex scenario? So it's much more complicated than before, right? We have so many different types of response rates and uh, observable hypothetical response rates. So this is where it turns out GIP sampling really helps us. Okay, so the previous examples where we saw for response rate, we, we did a Bayesian setup where that was a very elementary form of Gibbs sampling. It's so simple that we should not even be calling it Gibbs sampling. But in this case, for this more complicated setup, there, we, we are doing real Gibbs sampling. Okay, um, the way that works is, um, so we, we um, I'm going to skip over a lot of details. Um, so. Roughly speaking, this is how it works. We start with a random parameter vector, theta, which has two types of parameters. It's going to have um, user latent behaviors that are not observable as some parts of the parameter vector. The other parts are going to be their probabilities of those user behaviors. Okay? And then we set up a prior distribution on these parameters. And then we sample from the posterior of these pa parameter vector, theta. And the lift is a simple function of these, the theta vector, all right? And then, of course, we compute the percentiles to get our confidence bounds. But Gibbs sampling is actually very tricky in this, in this situation because, like I said, the prior distribution makes, um, we need to start with the prior distribution. And that makes a difference. So the region into, into which the Gibbs sampler settles depends, can be sensitive to the prior distribution. So one, the best remedy for this is to try many different prior distributions, maybe hundreds of them. And this is where, again, Spark helps us to do this, uh, in, you know, we can run many different prior distributions in parallel. So let's recap a little bit on how we are using um, Monte Carlo simulations. One is for confidence intervals, as I've been talking about. And here's a slightly other related question, which is, what is the sufficient sample size you need to, in order for your confidence intervals to be narrow enough? Okay, so that's kind of like a flip of the confidence intervals question. So, you know, in order to get reliable estimates for response rates or lift, how many samples or how many um, trials do we need to run? The other different use of um, uh, random, random, sorry, so, um, Monte Carlo simulations is to understand complex phenomena that are difficult to analyze uh, in closed form. And that's going to be what I'll talk about in the next few slides.
Okay? So this is the, the second complication I want to introduce into this problem, which is cookie contamination. Users have many different cookies, and there may be contamination in the test and control. So this is kind of what it, what it looks like. Okay. So remember that we're doing everything at the cookie level, right? We're getting all these incoming opportunities. We don't know what are the real users behind those cookies. All we see is the cookie ID. Very often, of course, we're able to link multiple cookies together, saying that, you know, these belong to the same user. And, we, you know, that's a different, uh, a whole different um, problem that we are working on at Media Math. But in general, all you see is a cookie ID. So let's look at this user. He has five cookies. Let's say two of them get assigned to control and the other three go to test. So the problem with this, and then um, the test users may see ads if they win the auction, and uh, control users do not. The problem is that control cookies will start to behave like test cookies in terms of response rates. Why? Because, because the real user behind those, the control cookie, has other cookies that got assigned to test. So the actual user has actually seen ads, potentially. So this is called cookie contamination. And it's a very complex phenomenon, as you can imagine. Um, so we want to be able to answer several questions about cookie contamination. You know, one is, um, how does this affect measured lift at the cookie level, which is the obvious question. The other is, um, how does the cookie distribution matter? Does it make a difference if we say every user has, this, has five cookies, or there's a distribution of cookies and the average is five. You know, does, it, does, this, does this make a difference? And, um, and so the other is, how does the control percentage affect the impact of cookie uh, contamination? So these are all very complex uh, questions with complicated interactions. So um, simulations are basically the best way to understand this. And here's how we organize our simulations. We, um, we have a scenario file where each, each scenario is a collection of parameters, okay? And mo one of the most important parameters is the number of trials you want to make for this scenario. And the rest of the parameters are details about um, exactly what you want to simulate, like number of users, number of, um, what is the cookie percentage, um, the cookie distribution, the true uh, um, control response rate if they have not seen an ad, and the true lift A. So the true lift means, A means that the, uh, a user who has seen an ad, their response rate is going to be R times 1 plus A. Okay? And so, and, we, and there could be thousands of scenarios, and each scenario we may need to run that m a million times, or 10 million times. So this is how we organize the computations in Spark. So let's say there are two scenarios. Is S needs to be run a million times, and scenario T needs to be run um, half a million times. So what we do first is we divide the trials of each scenario into reasonable sized chunks. So in this case, we are dividing the million trial scenario S into 10 chunks of 100,000 trials each. And similarly for the other one. And then we group these chunks into reasonable size gr uh, groupings, and then we send them to different executors. And finally, we do a reduce by key to, to get um, stats for each scenario. Because each trial of a scenario will give us a lift number, right? And then after running that scenario a million times, so from each of the million trials, we'll get a different lift number. So we can compute like, things like average lift and also the five, you know, 95 and, and, and the percentiles that we want for our confidence intervals. So here's an example of how results from a simulation from running hundreds of simulations might look like. There's a lot going on here, but basically, uh, on the x-axis, we have the true lift, A, and the y-axis, we are showing the, um, the um, measured cookie level lift, okay? So each dot here is the result of the expect, you know, average lift value that we calculated from running that scenario, one scenario, a million times, each dot. So if, if the measured lift was always the same as the true lift, then all of those dots will lie on the thin blue lines in each plot. Okay. And what we're showing uh, all of these different plots are each column is a, is a different uh, cookie distribution, and each row is a different uh, control percentage. So the first three columns um, are showing different cookie distributions, but their average number of cookies per user is always two. 
Okay? Um, the first two columns have some distribution, but the third column is exactly two, and so on. And, and also the shaded region there, that's the 90% 90 uh, confidence interval. So there are many conclusions you can draw from this kind of a plot. For example, you can see that as the uh, number of cookies per user goes up, we are, the measured cookie level lift keeps going down. Right on the right two plots, right two columns, you can see that. Um, also, the uncertainty in the measured lift drops as the control percentage goes up. So the, as the percentage of control population goes up to 50%, you can see the, the bands get narrow. And so I will leave it there. I will not go into any more observations about that. But um, I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you. Thanks. Um, which libraries or frameworks do you use to do Bayesian inference on Spark? We wrote our own. Um, there is no, uh, we use Scala mostly for Spark. And uh, there was no ready-made package to use in Scala. I know there is in Python there is PyMC. But um, I, I tried that PyMC um, separately you know, on, on a single computer, but um, it's kind of slow. Yeah. It's cute. It's really nice. But it's very slow. Thanks. Hi, I'm interested in how you um, measure lift, considering that different cookies can have different number of bid opportunities. But to a cookie might come multiple times, you're saying? Yeah, the, like, yeah. They, they can be measured multiple times. That is uh, actually, yeah, that's exactly what we, I didn't even get into that, but we are dealing with that, where a cookie can appear multiple times, so there is a frequency effect, right? The, a cookie might see ads multiple times, and so we are actually, we actually modeled that. We, we fitted a uh, frequency response curve and we put that into our model. So yeah, yeah. We, do, we do take that into account. Thank you. Uh, so we're sort of uh, running a little over schedule, but uh, if you have any other questions, uh, you just we take them offline. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good